podcast. Today we are speaking with Steve Saporn, a distinguished professor of folklore at Utah State University and the author of an article in the Utah Historical Quarterly about a bear and a bandit. I'm Holly George. And I'm Jedediah Rogers. All right. I'll ask our first question. Um, Steve, could you briefly recount the stories of Domenico Tiburzi and Old Ephraim and describe some of the lore that's grown up around these stories? Sure. Um, of course, I could say, do you want the five-minute version or the two-minute version or the one-hour version? <laughs> because, as you know, Old Ephraim has yeah. people perform it, and it can go on literally for an hour. I guess the two-minute version. <laughs> Well, of course, fortunately, the two stories have parallel structure, so and it's really quite simple. Um, for uh, Old Ephraim, the story is really the story of hunting him down and killing him. And, of course, there's countless variations, but basically, um, Frank Clark, if the hunter is named, is out herding sheep, and he has been trying to trap Ephraim for many years. And uh, this time, somehow, Ephraim stumbles and gets caught in the trap, but that doesn't really stop him. And there's an all-night-long kind of uh, chase, hunting, seeking him. And then, uh, at some time after dawn, um, Frank Clark kills him with his last bullet, which is oftentimes the seventh. Uh, and uh, old Ephraim is distracted momentarily by the barking of Frank Clark's dog, Jenny turns his head and Frank Clark gets the shot in a vulnerable spot, kind of the Achilles heel, I suppose, mm -hmm. only it's his neck, and kills him. And then he's uh, burned and um, the remains are buried, burned for three days, I think, in a lot of the versions. And uh, Boy Scouts, this is about 1921, 23, something like that. Boy Scouts, a few months later, hike up Logan Canyon to retrieve the skull because the Smithsonian doesn't believe that there's, there were any grizzlies left. So they retrieve the skull to uh, ship it back. And sure enough, he's not only, at least in the stories, a grizzly, but the biggest grizzly ever. And, um, and that's that story. Now, <clears throat> Domenico Tiburzi, um, not so well known here, but well known in Italy, everyone would recognize his name there, I think, uh, as the last great bandit versus the, in comparison to the last great uh, grizzly. Also, the story, the big immediate parallel, is that it's the story not of his life, but of his death. And both of these have that same that same emphasis. And in Domenico Tiburzi's case, about 30 years earlier, late 1890s, um, he's an aging bandit um, <coughs> who uh, roams this area called the Marema, which at that time was a really rugged, um, tough part of Italy, untamed, dangerous to live in because of the malaria, and uh, full of swamps. And again, the, 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 the story is of him, uh, in a sense, in this case, more betrayed by the barking of a dog. Uh, <clears throat> but he's staying uh, with some a peasant family uh, on their farm that night. Where the circumstances of that are kind of contested whether he was welcomed there or he imposed himself there. Uh, <clears throat> he's there with his lieutenant, Fioravanti, and the dog barks, and a Carabinieri patrol, the Carabinieri or the Italian National Police, um, who are looking for him, uh, hear the dog barking and come to the house. There's a shootout. Um, Tiburzi is killed. And then in the next uh, day, uh, the, the only evidence we, in fact, the only photograph we have, which appears in the article, of course, is Tiburzi propped up against a pillar uh, with his gun, and he's dead, propped up, bandoliers of, of uh, bullets across his chest, the gun in hand, and uh, if you look closely, you can see that he is dead. And, um, and that's his end, although we might get into it, how he actually died is open uh, for discussion, and 
then he's supposedly, according to the story, buried in the cemetery. Um, but there was an argument as to whether he uh, should be buried in the cemetery because he was such an evil man. Priests didn't want him buried in the cemetery. The townspeople did. So the story is they compromised partly in the cemetery, partly out. Um, the cemetery grew, and um, the location of the burial was uh-huh. lost in the, in the memory. Um, but what is there today, which I just saw a month mm-hmm. or two ago, is the pillar that he was propped up against for that photograph in 1896. And that marks his supposed burial spot in the cemetery, and it's got an inscription on it. And so again, just as with um, Ephraim, his end is kind of mysterious, and his the burial spot is uncertain. What's some of the lore around both of these characters? Well, I think really the stories themselves are the major, the mm-hmm. major uh, expressions of lore. And in the case of Tiburtzi, the stories really vary from him being a hero to being a villain. I mean, he can be told in some of the stories he's a Robin Hood type figure Mm -hmm. but as I talk to people in Italy about him they'll often say you know he really wasn't a very good guy he was a very evil character and some of the writing about him says he was actually in league with the oppressive landowners in the area Mm -hmm. and and exploited the um, uh, the people who tried to work there and I think the same goes for um, Old Ephraim, he's, you know, there are these funny, um, almost triggers about about the story in more like the pizza, mm-hmm. the pizza uh, uh, place, um, images of, of bears everywhere. Of Old Ephraim, um, but the way the, the 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 outstanding folklore about them is the stories themselves, okay. and I, they trump everything else. And other things act to trigger the, the story. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, how did you realize that they had they, these two characters seem so disparate and such you know world apart? How did you realize they had a lot in common? You know, that's it's a really timely question because I Good. was just <laughs> going through my journals for quite a few years um, because I'm doing some other research and then. In Italy, and I was just reading through to try to find all the things relevant to that other topic. Uh, oh. This was just a few days ago, and popped out of me where I first wrote down this idea. Oh. And 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 it, and there is it is I mean it's trivial in one way, but <laughs> it's interesting in another because it's kind of at least tells me how I get ideas. It just popped out, fully formed, <laughs> um, one paragraph. I have the whole idea of this comparison. (laughs) And the circumstance was simply that, I think this is the important part, I had just arrived in Italy to do this other research, and I had a couple of days in Rome that I was just kind of hanging out. And uh, in other words, I think this is important for all researchers, I was freed up of my everyday routine and my everyday work, and my mind was associating freely. And I had heard about Tiburtzi a couple of years before that. And of course, I knew about Ephraim forever. But um, it just kind of popped out. I didn't, I wasn't doing research on it. I wasn't thinking about it that I knew of. Maybe subliminally I was. Mm-hmm. And then I look at the, the, at the entry and it's just, these two have a lot in common, you know. And wouldn't this be a interesting kind of article. Although I also think at the time I didn't know if anyone would take it seriously huh. because it's kind of an odd comparison. That's a good lesson <laughs> for researching. I think so. I think you need to break out of your routines and you need to ideally go somewhere else mm-hmm. and then you just kind of see things differently. I've always been interested in bears. I mean, that, that's true. Mm-hmm. And obviously Italy and living in Utah. And, and I think, you know, the physical... The picture of Tiburtzi, if you have it in mind, people see it in the article. He really does suggest a bear. He does look he's like a bear. He's a big bear. fellow. He just, he's that. 
an interesting thing I learned recently when I was in Italy talking to uh, people who know about Tiburzi is that he's often seen there as a cinghiale. Cinghiale is a uh, wild boar. And the wild boar is common to this really uh, rugged area. It's what people like to hunt, people like to eat, and people like to avoid running into <laughs> face to face. Um, but he is that kind of scary, bristly, burly character who, you know, they, and they don't have bears there, so that would be the animal of choice to compare him to. But they do think of him, or did think of him, as animal-like and wild. So then as you, you also, it's, it's amazing, in your article you outline ten plot elements that are very parallel between the stories. Did you realize those as you began researching? Yeah, I think the, the idea was uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot in common here. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a comparison, and I think I mainly had in mind just this, the physical nature of a bear and a man, a, a, a bear-like man and a man-like bear, mm -hmm. you know. Um, <clears throat> and and there was, and that was the core idea. But when I sat down, then it was more methodical, yeah. and really compared, looked at the story, and the, the first realization was. Hey, these guys have long careers as marauders, as bandits, as outlaws. But the story only deals with this last little bit of it. That in itself is really interesting, folkloristically and humanistically, mm -hmm. right? All the rest of the story doesn't really count. It's like, I mean, I won't um, claim it's quite at the level of the Iliad, mm -hmm. but you know, the Iliad is a story about a 10 year war. But the action is in the last month of it or so, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the other part is kind of just skipped over and it's there, but the, but that's the important part. So from that core of similarity, then when I looked at it more methodically, wow, there was a lot of real, even to a detail like that dog. I like that detail <laughs> a lot. <laughs> that's very barking. interesting. Is it, is, it, is it happenstance that there's that there is so much parallel between the two stories, or does the parallel reflect the nature of folklore itself? Do we see the, these types of elements of the story in other folklore stories as well? Yes, I think so. You know, very specifically that thing I was trying to describe earlier about about the burial. There is a, a, a kind of a famous, although pretty old, article called "The Hero of Tradition." Um, by a British uh, anthropologist, folklorist, scholar, in which he identifies, I think, something like 22, 24, something like that, uh, elements, maybe it's even more than that, elements that are plot elements in narrative about classical heroes, mm -hmm. classical and biblical, and actually even Far Eastern mm -hmm. mythic heroes. They all have um, some of these elements, and some of them have more than others. None of them have all of them, I don't think. But so they are motifs. Folklorists would say a motif that appears in the life of a hero. So we have something like at least one of those in Tiburzi and uh, Ephraim's uh, lives. And that suggests, what I think is behind this kind of take me a long while to get around to, but there's something about narratives that we learn that give us narrative expectations. So maybe you hear something and over time uh, you retell it, you may hear other people telling it, maybe something happens when you're not telling it in your mind, and you borrow those other elements that should be in that story mm -hmm. because it's about a hero so it's mm -hmm. got to have the heroic elements mm -hmm. and you, without even being conscious of it um, they, they become part of the narrative and then as you retell it you feel like you don't think about it they were always there they were always part of the story mm -hmm. I think that's the deeper level at which folklore works so you know we hear we we grow up with fairy tales, with different legends, with stories about heroes, and then we have life experiences, and then people around us do, and we reshape 
hmm. what we what happened historically, uh, anecdotally, to to conform to a pattern that somehow says this is the way it should be or says mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. true. Well, I think in a few minutes I actually want to go back to generally what folklore tells us. Um, just to go back briefly to the story of Old Ephraim. Um, here in your article you outline not only two quite disparate people and animals, be it person and animal, but also places. Can you um, talk to us a little bit about what insights you gained about the parallels between Marema and Cache Valley? Sure. Um, who would ever have thought that <laughs> these two places had anything in common, right? Mm-hmm. And, and in some ways, you know, when I look at myself doing this, I'm thinking, well, you know, you love Italy and you love Cache Valley and you've lived in both places and you want to somehow bring them together. So is this <laughs> just my, my own <laughs> psychological uh, adventure? Um, and maybe so, but, you know, uh, there, there's really something to it. And um, the similarities that I, that I see uh, and I talk about a little bit is that at the time of these stories, they were both coming, to, they were at the end, maybe they had just passed the end of their frontier era. So they were both frontiers pretty recently, uh, and they passed out of that fairly recently. And although one is, you know, high altitude, 5,000 feet, dry, alpine, um, and the other is at sea level, um, Swampy, damp, humid, warm, it doesn't snow there. Um, they were still both, what was in common was that they were both rugged, um, really um, places that were all, you know, if we go back 100, 150 years ago, not a lot of people were living in either place. Um, uh, descriptions of the Marema from even in the 19, uh, early 1900s, really a, a, a deserted place, a dangerous place. Mm-hmm. And that would maybe be the other thing, is that wilderness you know, used to always represent danger. Now we think mm-hmm. of it as recreation, but uh, that's the change that happens in both places when they go from uh, being the frontier to being part of civilization. So the yeah. stories reflect this change, I think this so. change of a place. and. Is it the case generally that folklore tells us something about uh, or reveal insights about a place and the changes that occur at that place? That's certainly one of the things and a a very big thing. I think more generally what folklore does is tell you what's going on uh, in a society or in a culture or in a group of people. Is the difference that I would always say between, and it's what makes folklore so important, is the difference between, say, a folk narrative and, a, and an author's written narrative in literature, is that the you know the author, the modern writer, professional writer's narrative, tells you what that person is thinking and feeling and what their ideas are and their attitudes, and we don't know if it extends beyond that person. But a folk narrative, because it's repeated by many people and mm-hmm. prized and kept alive, it tells you what a whole group of people are thinking. So certainly in this circumstance, it tells you about change and it tells you about, mm-hmm. about and often because one of our major divisions of folklore is region, we talk about ethnic folklore, mm-hmm. about gender folklore, um, religious folklore, but regional folklore is another very major thing. So it tells us about what people in a particular place think at a particular time, although it's usually it's an extended period of time. At least that's how I would think of it. The other thing I would say in connection with that is that I think folklore has to withstand a much greater um, test of uh, meaningfulness than, say, um, high literature, again, lack of a better term to make the distinction, yeah. I don't think high, you know, art literature, 
high literature, professional literature, I don't know what to call it. I don't think it's yeah. better than folk literature, but we don't have a, a good terminology. But at any rate, you know, the example I often give is if if Shakespeare fell out of fashion and nobody read Shakespeare, nobody produced Shakespeare plays for 200 years, we wouldn't lose Shakespeare because it's in the library, right? Mm -hmm. It's there, it's in print, and it could always come back. But folk narrative doesn't have that luxury. If for one generation people stop telling an oral tale, there's no record of it, except maybe in the folklore archives now. But it can only be sustained as long as it's meaningful. No one's forcing you to tell the old Ephraim story, right? You don't have to study it in college. You don't have to study it in high school. It's not part of anybody's canon. It's not. Uh, it's only remembered and told because it really, really means something to people. So, it, I know it's one of your other questions. Um, it's one of the reasons why historians and literary people and everybody should pay attention because these are things that really um, pass the test, the harshest test of survivability, relevance. People don't have to tell these stories. They only do it because they matter. So that means it's a direct barometer for us to find out what's important to people, if we can interpret them correctly mm -hmm. or fairly, or just read what people are saying with them. What are some other insights historians can learn from folklorists and from folklore? <clears throat> That's a, a wonderful question, and I should say, as I think back, you know, the some of the folklorists I've known have been historians. Certainly, uh -huh. the, the major uh, American folklorist in mid twentieth century, Richard Dorson, really his appointment was in history, and he was a historian who studied folklore. I think probably, I've already said what maybe the most important thing is, mm -hmm. is that you hear something that with, really withstands the test of time, but also it's the voice of many people instead of one. And of course, we all know that for most of history, for most people, um, literacy and written records were not an option. So the, the written records that we typically study, and I know history has become a lot more sophisticated than just looking at written yeah. records. I know that's, that could be a stereotype too. But um, you're oftentimes looking at the elite levels of culture rather than the folk levels of culture. For instance, I've been, you know, one of the things I've, I've really been interested in in recent years is the study of food ways. Yeah. And um, it's really, that's really been explored by a lot of disciplines. But of course, if you think of medieval times or early modern times, um, it's easier to know the diet of the wealthy because they yeah. kept track than um, the, the diet of the, of the illiterate. And I'm trying to find out now, how do you do find out um, the, what the great masses were really eating uh, from the records? that they did not keep. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think I've kind of wandered from your question. No, I, I, track. I could but, listen to yeah. you talk about food waste all day. <laughs> I love it. Um, I guess I'll bring it back to Utah. Uh, throughout your career, you um, you know, working with students, other things, have you seen similarities between Utah and other spots in the world? Absolutely, yes. Good, what are they? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. You know, the thing that about, um, well, I was, I was thinking of a couple, of maybe the other two best known legends in Cache Valley, yeah. most turned in by students at least. Um, one of them is about St. Anne's Retreat. St. Anne's Retreat was a, it's also called the Nunnery, that's the title given to it. It was a, um, a group of cabins a little ways up Logan Canyon, maybe about mm -hmm. five miles up the canyon. Um, where uh, evident from the factual record, um, nuns from the diocese in Salt Lake, and I'm pretty sure it was just nuns, uh, would go, you know, for kind of time away, meditation, a break from things, uh, a retreat. So it was called St. Anne's Retreat. Um, but the local story was that nuns who were pregnant were sent there. <laughs> 
You say, of course, because you recognize the story, yeah. right? Even if you yeah. don't know St. Anne's Retreat's yeah. story. Right? So they were sent there to have their babies, and they killed them, drowned them in a pool there. There's some kind of pool. And, um, and, and that was the background story. Uh, when I was first in Logan, uh, the stories that were often turned in were about legend tripping. Legend tripping is when people, usually young people, go to the site of a supernatural occurrence uh, that there's a legend about and try to re-experience it. So the typical thing for kids growing up in Logan uh, High School would be to go with other friends um, up there late at night and try to get scared by the nuns who would come out uh, with, in one version, they have these um, frightening dogs that would attack them. And um, they're the nuns, the ghosts of the nuns, um, the spirits of the nuns, frightening experience, and then you, you know, drive off mm -hmm. when something happens, right? More recently, there was one of those things went awry, I think it's been about 10 or 15 years now, one of those, um, legend tripping experiences and there because there were guards set there because they had sold St. Anne's Retreat to some foundation and they're trying to prevent trespassing anyway. These guys, the guards got out of control and rounded up all the kids and, and really did scare them. So that story now has replaced the older story. At any rate, I'm kind of getting off track. The point is that what could be seen as an anti-Catholic story yeah. exists everywhere in the world. Not, you know, it's not just up Logan Canyon. Um, where I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, we heard that story about the, you know, the Catholic Church there. Um, I taught in Portugal for a year. And Portugal, a Catholic country, Catholics told it <laughs> about uh, one particular location where on one hill there was a monastery on the facing hill, uh, there was a nunnery, and the story was that there was a tunnel that went between them that was lined with the, the bones of aborted fetuses. So that would be an anti-clerical rather than an anti-Catholic mm -hmm. story. It's just all over. And when I use this in class, students who've been on missions in Cuba, not Cuba, in Dominican Republic, places like that, they all heard them. And whenever, of course, you hear it for the first time, you think, oh, that's not really true then, because it appears everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. So that, um, I probably spent too much time on that, but yeah. that's a good example of something that kids growing up in Logan might hear and think of as, a, you know, a unique story to Logan Canyon, but it's an international legend of what we call a migratory legend because it moves all over the place and then becomes a local legend attached to a certain place. Hmm. So that's one of many examples. So that, that's interesting. I mean, so stories migrate. They might move from one location to the next, but they also change over time, I, I would imagine, as folks are, I mean, they're not necessarily re reflected in, in the documentary record, so they're told as oral tradition and then as they're being told, and I imagine they change. What talk to us about that process and how it changes what we uh, understand about the events that these stories describe, as well as the people telling the events, the stories. Well, one of the things um, that, that's a rich question. Um, one of the things that occurs to me immediately is to go back to our story. Is um, you know, I had a reference to another last grizzly bear being killed in Colorado and another one in California. Um, some of the changes are to make the story, or, or kind of artistic changes, to make the story more credible in the environment in which it's told, right? So um, it's a man in Italy, it's a bandit, a human, mm -hmm. it's an animal, a bear, in the Western United States, maybe it's a, another creature or another kind of person somewhere else to carry the same kind of story that's really a story, again, about the passing of the frontier. Um, so some of the changes, maybe that's more a metaphor for the kinds of changes, mm -hmm. they simply have to artistic, they have to fit the environment that they're in because 
they're, you're trying to convince somebody in a certain sense, right, mm-hmm. that this is true. So it's got to it's got to fit together um, in a way that that makes sense where it's told. So that's another way in which place comes into into the story and affects the story. Mm-hmm. Could could you ask me that question again because I feel like I just hit the tip of it. it well, I mean, as I mean, you before you talked about the marriage between folklore and history. Of course, historians like to look at patterns and change over time. I, I guess I was curious to know how how the stories themselves often tend to change and evolve. Yeah. Um, and I'll leave it at that. I was going to ask something sure. very much related. Um, a, another point, a real interesting insight that you make in your article is that uh, folklore is often shaped, or op- folklore shapes the memory of the events, in this case, the story of the bandit and the bear. And I I suppose that that's um, another way in which folklore and the stories themselves both evolve as well as folklore contributes to the evolving of how one remembers those particular events. Yes. I know this is a very much involved question, but I I appreciate your insight. I think I understand it. think for a moment here it's you mentioned patterns and, and, and contextualizing that question uh, folklore's have always been um, concerned with patterns and in fact that's you know that's what this article started was spotting a similar pattern that was kind of unexpected and then and, and going from there but I think as I was saying earlier we have these narratives or bits of narratives um, in that give us expectations for the way a plot is going to play out, and um, so that influences the way that we structure what we experience. Um, I've seen it with immigration narratives, with um, you know, all kinds of stories of triumph. I was just thinking about it recently. This is a little bit um, a stretch to talk about it folkloristically, but I guess we don't have to be real strict <laughs> about the limits. You know about this controversy recently about the uh, NBC News reporter, Brian... Oh, uh, yeah. Brian... Brian Williams. Brian Williams, yeah. yes. Um, <clears throat> looking at it from a folkloristic point of view, <laughs> I, I have to really have compassion for him, and I don't understand why the other members of the media uh, are being so self-righteous, uh, because it doesn't seem to me that it's an outright lie. It seems to me unlikely that someone would tell it, self-consciously tell a lie about their experience to 10 million people and think they weren't going to get caught. Maybe that's some kind of ultimate arrogance, but it seems much more likely to me that he has restructured his memory of his own experience in keeping with a better narrative, the way we all do. And it's really what I've been talking about in many ways, about stories. You know, something happened to me, something happened to my father um, over the years as I retell that story and get a better reaction by changing it a little bit without even consciously changing, making it more dramatic, having the grenade launcher go through the helicopter I was in rather than the one behind or in front, um, I start to believe that story too, Um, especially since no, you know, and from what I understand, one of the accusations is um, he told this lie multiple times. Well, but did anybody ever call him on it? If they, if they, someone said, "Hey, that couldn't really have happened," and he continued, that would be one thing. But no one has ever said that they said to him, "Hey, that's not true." So if they, if they listened to it and they said, "Wow," that reinforced that it was a true story for him. Just like we we all do. 
My, my father had a, had a saying uh, that I never understood until recently. It was, uh, I don't lie, but I don't always tell the truth. And we always took it as kind of a, oh, you know, well, so you kind of you fudge on it. But I think if I take it in the context of, of this controversy and of folklore, it's, you know, I don't mean, I don't necessarily lie, but who remembers anything exactly as it happened? And part of the reason, I mean, I think part of the reason we do that, and maybe this goes to the heart of the importance of folklore and storytelling in general, is we add meaning. We change the story. Sure, I mean, we inflate our egos. He was in a more dangerous situation and he survived it, right? It, 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 it makes him more important. But it also makes it more intense and it makes the story more meaningful. And I think that's one of the things that guides um, the ways in which we change stories. We are always subconsciously, perhaps, aiming towards a more meaningful and artistic uh, story, because it's about communication, about past experience. It's not always about literal truth. For literal truth, we do want, we, I mean, that's important, I'm not denying that, but in everyday existence for humans for thousands of years, we can only, we have to carry forward what's really meaningful, and I think that's what guides the, the way stories are changed. Well, this is quite different question. Um, I wanted if, to know if you could talk to our readers and our listeners, I guess, about collecting folklore. I remember I took a folklore class from you, a fieldwork class, a long time ago. And um, I remember you saying, you don't ask people, just tell me a story. You have to kind of prompt them or guide them or give a trigger. And um, I, I think that was your class and that you also said, the best stories come as you're heading out the door. <laughs> and so do you have advice for our listeners about collecting folklore from their families or from their lives? Yeah, uh, that's a wonderful question. Um, and you prompted me with it. Oh, so good. That's, <laughs> so it makes my job a little easier. Um, <laughs> and I want to say that um, you learned something well that I learned from another Utah folklorist, uh, mm -hmm. uh, William A. Wilson, Burt Wilson from yeah. BYU. Um, who wrote an article called Folklore and History, too. Yeah. Uh, but he, um, he always said, in, for beginning folklore classes, for one thing, that you should, you know, you're going to be tempted to collect some kind of exotic folklore from someone, from hmm. somewhere else and something exotic. And he said, no, you should really start with yourself and your family. Hmm. You can go on from there if you want. So one thing I really like about your question is you already make that assumption that people are going to be collecting from their families. And I think that's really, I mean, I think that's very wise and very important. I got it after reading a Burt Wilson article. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the truth comes out. Well, that's, that's good. <laughs> that's, that's, that's very good. Um, I'm sure he'd be happy to know that. But I found that to be true. You know, Collect and, from your own life. And certainly um, some of my best stuff is from my, my father. Um, because you know, you know what to ask. You know what you're talking about. You um, sometimes there's a little bit of difficulty in that because it's like, well, you already know this story. Why are you asking for it? You know, huh. and you can explain that. But mostly, it's really a plus, especially when it comes to understanding what's going on, because you have all that background information to <clears throat> understand what's going on. But back to really your question, I would say one of the best things to do is to try to piggyback onto some kind of natural context in which stories are told or reminiscences come up. Hmm. So, for instance, um, <clears throat> after Thanksgiving dinner, people are still sitting around the table because they can't move, <laughs> or possibly even during the dinner, but that might be kind of imposing something that yeah. would be impolite to do. But, you know, put the tape recorder out in the middle of the table. Of course, you never record without people's permission. Um, but you that's a natural storytelling context. Mm -hmm. And so that would be 
a real good time to get stories. And also, <clears throat> there's a, it sometimes it's a little bit difficult in transcribing, but in having several people rather than just the one-on-one, -on -one, they prompt each other. <laughs> or they say, it didn't really happen that way, <laughs> and then you get more than one version of mm -hmm. the story, which of course is the lifeblood of folklore. Or they add to something, or someone finally finds out you know, <laughs> the, re the rest of the story, as they great. say, right? So I think you look for opportunities like that. Another one that, um, that another technique that um, I've done and that um, only my wife was just reminding me of this morning, she says, you know, if you want to interview, let's say, a, a woman, you go to her kitchen and have her and work with her making bread, making that's good something, advice. you know. So it's that's something, good advice. it's that, first of all, that's an environment where, you know, I don't want to be sexist here, but women talk to each other, well, men too, but yeah. a mother or a daughter working in the kitchen, whoever, mm -hmm. uh, that's the place where stories are told. Uh, while you're working, while you're doing it, you're conversing and stories come up. Um, and and you're, because your hands are busy, your mind can relax. I think is what mm. she's really saying. You're you're distracted. You're 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 not in, you're not you don't have the spotlight on you, uh, and you and it's a normal way of doing it. So I think that's those are a couple of really. So you good could work in the things. garden with someone, or absolutely yes, yeah. okay. or be out. You know, I remember once. Um, wanting interviewing someone in Boise about the Basque Hotel, about what mm -hmm. about sheep herders who used to yeah. stay there and, and, and in the winters and this was someone who was older and remembered it. And we just went to the oh, the site, which was kind of an abandoned building then it was gonna be it ended up being turned into a museum. But we walked around with the tape recorder. It was a tape recorder in those days. And we walked around and the physical sight triggered memories mm -hmm. and stories and events that, you know, maybe sitting in an office, it wouldn't happen. Which that reminded me of, a, I'll give you one more technique, because these techniques trigger other techniques. Oftentimes, I remember um, interviewing uh, older people about their stories they're growing up. And at some point, and this was always a very good thing, they might pull out a family photo album, yeah. and they, and you can you can consciously do that with your family. You can go through, and then you have to on the recording identify what picture you're looking at, so that you can hmm. connect the mm -hmm. what's Keep on the tape with the image later. But you know, there's stories I know in my family that that's the only time they're told is when you're going through the photo album and you see somebody. It's not because they're are forbidden stories or anything. It's just no, that's, that's the, when you remember. That's them. when you remember them exactly. Those mm -hmm. are the triggers. I remember when my dad grew up in East LA and driving through his old neighborhood with him, and he told us these stories. Um, dad, this was your life, really? It was fascinating. So I guess yeah, yeah, going to the place and that's a good idea. Yeah, go to the place and go around. <laughs> and because our recording equipment is so mobile today, it's not a problem. <laughs> I mean. When I started, the tape recorders were like this, and they weighed a ton, huh. <laughs> so it was a little harder. Well, I mean, just listening to you talk makes me realize that humans are, we're, we're story, we tell stories, that's what we do. That's and so I was true. wondering what you, what you think about, are, are we, do we still have a vibrant storytelling culture um, and a transmission of these stories from people to people? or? Or has that changed in any way um, over the years? I think the answer is is yes and yes. <laughs> I think we really do. Um, there, are, sometimes we use the title instead of uh, Homo sapiens, Homo narans, hmm. human, the storyteller, and that hmm. some way seems to be, you know, one of our most distinguishing characteristics and. Uh, <laughs> you know, there was this conference at Utah State a few years ago where they brought in a couple of supercomputers um, uh, for the conference, and they were 
they had it all set up and brought in these scientists from all over. And then the, the, and they kind of didn't know what to do. They said, "Well, let's um, let's ask these computers. Um, let's ask them if they think the computers will ever replace human beings." So they typed in that question, and the computer buzzed in word, and out came a voice saying. That reminds me of a story. <laughs> so I, I snuck in a little joke, uh, meta folklore, folklore about folklore, right? Uh -huh. But I think it says it well in that um, we're even in our electronic digital age. I mean, there's folklorists who specialize in digital folklore now, and in fact, we have oh. courses at Utah State, and uh, we have a specialist who teaches digital folklore, and, oh, and so the internet. From their point of view, and I admit to being um, of another era and not so up to date on this topic, but a lot of storytelling goes on on the internet. I know that much, and and so it's it's to me it's somewhere between oral and written. I'm not sure exactly where it goes, but a lot of the stories that have always been told are being told again uh, in email communication and websites and stuff like that. Um, so the question is, so the answer is, yes, we keep telling, and yes, it changes, maybe the technology changes. Um, when I first studied, started studying folklore, we used to say that because of the pace of modern life, we've stopped telling the folk tales orally, the, the um, Mersh and the Long stories like in the Grimm Brothers, Cinderella, you know, um, what, the, the cat with the seven league boots, all those magical tales. Um, and instead we tell a lot more jokes and a lot more legends because they are short and fit modern life. Hmm. I don't know if that's exactly true or not. Certainly the fairy tales have an ongoing life in, in written form and in some cultures they're still told orally, um, but the point is, maybe in one era, one genre, one type of story gets emphasized more than another. But I, I think we, you know, if you kept a, a story diary for a week and made some notation every point in the day in which you told some kind of a story, I think you'd find it's constant. Mm -hmm. And usually when we, when we, when we. When I teach the folk narrative course, they'll talk about those classic genres at the first part of the course. You know, the folk tale, the legend, um, tall tales, um, maybe narrative jokes, even myth. But the last part of the course, we concentrate on personal narrative. That is, the stories of things that happen to you that, as we were saying earlier, you recast in terms of other kinds of traditional narratives that you've heard before. But all those stories that you'd collect as family folklore, you know, mm -hmm. all those things that just when you go home, when you recount your day, oh. you know, you you cast it oftentimes in a narrative form, sometimes more artistically than other times. Mm -hmm. And sometimes certain things become recurrent and you tell them again and again and then they get shaped artistically and they do enter into your family folklore. Right? So, you yeah, know, we don't, you know, and actually maybe full circle, I mean the word history is the same root as story, right? And sometimes when I'm translating from Italian I'm not sure when they say storia, is it history or is it story? And in some sense those <laughs> concepts are conflated in Fascinating. It's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is my, fun. My pleasure. You guys are very good and you warm me up and I I hope someone <laughs> listens to our stories. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thanks so much. My pleasure.